My name is Stephen Howell and I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at UC Davis. Since 2006 I've performed 1700 kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasties. What I'd like to do is share with you what I think are the do's and don'ts for kinematically aligning a total knee arthroplasty as of 2011. By way of a conflict of interest, I'm a co-founder of Otis Med and a designer of kinematic alignment. I'm a consultant for striker orthopedics, and I'm a consultant and receive royalties from Biomed Sports Medicine. From my experience, I've come up with three do's that you need to do to kinematically align a total knee arthroplasty. First is find the three kinematic axes. The second is shape match a symmetric single radius femoral component to the restored articular surface of the femur. And then confirm that the four femoral bone resections, the two distal, the two posterior, after adjusting for the wear and the curve from the saw blade, equal the thickness of the femoral component. And when you perform these steps, you will restore the normal obliquity and level of the joint line back to the way the patient's knee was prior to developing arthritis, which kinematically aligns the knee and prevents flexion instability. So let's look at how to find the transverse axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. We're indebted to Hollister and Eckhoff for their seminal work in that there's a single transverse axis in the femur about which the tibia will flex and extend as you move the knee. To find this axis you want to project the lateral femoral condyle superimposed on the medial femoral condyle and then the medial femoral condyle superimposed on the lateral femoral condyle and then simply fit circles of equal radii to the two condyles. And then you find the center of the circles and the line that connects the center of the circles is the axis about which the tibia flexes and extends. There's a second axis in the femur that's also a transverse axis and it's the axis about which the patella flexes and extends. And we're indebted to Coughlin and Ironpore for their two articles that have showed us how this works. The axis about which the patella flexes and extends is about 10 millimeters proximal and about 12 millimeters anterior and parallel to the other transverse axis. And here you can see the axis is located anterior and proximal in both the lateral and medial femoral condyle. And then a line connecting these two points that's parallel to the other axis is the axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. The third axis is the longitudinal axis in the tibia about which the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur. Coughlin showed us this axis the best and here you can see that the longitudinal axis is anterior and perpendicular to the other two transverse axes here denoted with the orange line. So if you want to kinematically align the knee, then you need to shape match the femoral component to the restored articular surface of the femur. And so simply you bring in a symmetric single radius femoral component because according to our article in JBJS this past year, the radius of the medial and lateral femoral condyles are exactly the same in the knee with end-stage osteoarthritis, whether it's a valgus or varus knee. So we're superimpose the femoral condyle on the lateral projection and the medial projection and then we can see it in the coronal projection and the axial projection. And so if the femoral component is positioned back where the knee originally was, then the axes can be restored and the ligament lengths are unchanged. So shape matching will kinematically align the femoral component and will simultaneously maintain the normal orthogonal relationships between the three axes that define the kinematics of the knee. So the advantage of kinematic alignment is that you can use the measured resection of the distal and posterior femoral cuts to confirm that the femoral component is kinematically aligned interoperatively. And so if you can see here that we remove the bone distally and posteriorly to match the thickness of the component on the lateral and now the medial projection 
and the same for the coronal and the axial projection. And so all four resections, the two distal, the two, two posterior, should equal the thickness of the femoral component after you adjust for the wear and the curve of the saw blade. So in the operating room, the key instrument is really nothing more fancy than a caliper. And what you want to do is measure the thickness of each bone resection as they are removed from the femur. Therefore, the restoration of the normal joint line and kinematic alignment is confirmed by measuring these bone resections. So when the thickness of the four femoral bone resections, corrected for wear, here you can see the blue line on this valgus knee is where the wear is, corrected for the kerf or the notch created by the saw blade, which is typically one to one and a half millimeters, then each section should equal the thickness of the condyle of the femoral component. So here you can see the distal medial. It's a little smaller than the component because of the curve of the blade. Distal lateral is even smaller than the distal medial because it's a valgus knee and the wear is distal. And then the posterior medial and posterior lateral are symmetric and match that of the component minus the curve. So you can adjust the position of the femoral component for wear in the arthritic knee. And if you want, you can obtain an MRI. And what you'll notice is the wear is very focal. This happens to be a varus knee. The lateral side is projected on the left, and the medial side is projected on the right. And here you can see that the wear in the distal condyle is typically no more than 2 millimeters or less. There's very little bone loss on the medial or lateral side in the osteoarthritic knee. It's primarily on the tibial side. So all you need to do is correct for about 2 millimeters of wear on the worn side, and that will kinematically align your femoral component. And here you can see posteriorly that the wear on the condyle is typically on a varus knee one millimeter or less. So that means if you're setting the internal external rotation of the femoral component, you can just post your reference with no more than a millimeter adjustment. So let's look at the utility of measuring the distal femoral bone resections. So if we want to restore the normal joint line, then the thickness of the two distal resections should be about four to six millimeters on the worn surface and six to seven on the unworn surface if your femoral component is about eight millimeters thick. Of course, this thickness will change depending on the thickness of your component. So this happens to be a varus knee. The lateral side, it should be seven, and the medial side should be five or so for a two millimeter or two degree correction. Now you can interoperatively correct this. If one side of the distal femur is over-resected, then simply you can lift the chamfer guide off the femur, the thickness of the over-resection, and then later fill this in with bone cement. So we're going to tap the chamfer block in, and for demonstration we're going to assume that we took away two millimeters more bone than we wanted to medially. So we'll simply just readjust the position of the medial side so it's two millimeters off the distal cut and then pin it in that location and we'll fill this gap with cement. The next step to confirm kinematic alignment of the femoral component is to measure the posterior femoral bone resections. And to correctly set the IE rotation AP position of the femoral component, the thickness of the posterior resection should be about four to six millimeters on the worn side and six to seven on the unworn side. And so we simply posterior reference uh, with no increased external rotation and the posterior medial resection in this virus knee should be about six to seven millimeters thick and it should equal the posterior lateral resection uh, at six to seven millimeters to kinematically align and correctly set the IRER of the femoral component.
So if one side of the posterior femur is over-resected, then you can simply rotate the chamfer guide posterior the thickness of the over-resection on the side that has been over-resected. So here we put the pin in, we sort of eccentrically move that pinhole a little bit more posteriorly because we've taken an extra two millimeters off posterior medial and we can tap the guide in place and pin it and then change the position and fill the gap with cement. So you have this ability both on the distal and posterior cuts to adjust the position of the component by one to two millimeters if you need to to fine tone tune the kinematic position of the femoral component. So after performing 1,700 kinematically aligned tilde knee replacements, we've learned that there's three things that we don't want to do any longer. And one of them is we don't want to cut the distal femur perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur. We don't really want to externally rotate the femoral component. And we don't want to align to the epicondylar axis. And these steps, when you do them, unfortunately change the obliquity and the level of the joint line, which can kinematically malalign the knee, causing flexion instability or loss of motion. So let's look at some of the evidence that you shouldn't cut the femur perpendicular to the mechanical axis because it changes the obliquity and the level of the joint line. And this is a bone model uh, made from a computer scan showing the uh, axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. And that magenta line is the axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. Now we see the mechanical axis of the femur. And so if we're going to make a cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur, then we're going to take too much bone off distal medial, too little bone off distal lateral, and the femoral components axis is not going to be co-aligned with the transverse axis in the femur about which the tibia and patella flex and extend, and you're going to have problems with ligament balance as well as with patella tracking. So let's look at what happens when you align the femoral component to the mechanical axis of the femur, and that is it kinematically will malalign most knees. Here's a blow-up view of that distal femur, and here's a bone model in the coronal plane and a bone model in the axial plane. And we'll put the transverse axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends, and draw the transverse axis about which the patella flexes and extends, and the longitudinal axis in the tibia about which it internally and externally rotates on the femur. And so let's put the cut plane in for the uh, cut that's perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur. And you can see that you're going to take asymmetric bone resections, two large distal medial, probably just correct posterior lateral. And here we have too thin posterior lateral compared to uh, posterior medial because we've externally rotated the femoral component. And you have the asymmetric bone resections, which violates our principle of kinematically aligning the knee. And this will set off ligament imbalances and disturbance in the patella tracking. And here you can see the femoral component is now on cockeyed, so that its axis is not co-aligned with the transverse axis in the femur, about which the patella flexes and extends. And we've got the femoral component in external rotation. And so this is kinematically malaligned. You're going to have medial instability and extension. You're going to have lateral jamming and flexion. And this is an unresolvable situation and can't be managed by ligament releases. So I used to think that this obliquity of the kinematically aligned joint may not be safe because it, it changes the, it's not perpendicular to the weight-bearing axis. But there's evidence that it is safe because it does replicate the normal knee. Now if we go back to the seminal work by Dr. Hungerford and Krakow and their Total Joint Arthroplasty of the Knee article in Core of 85, they stated that they favor an anatomic orientation of the coronal plane wherein the joint line forms approximately a 2 to 3 varus angle relative to the mechanical axis. And so this is a patient where we build a 3D model from a long leg CT scan. And here's a patient with a kinematically aligned knee on the left and a mechanically aligned knee on the right. And so you can see the mechanical axis uh, in the, uh, just passes just slightly medial to the midline. And the joint line is 2 to 3 degrees varus with respect to the tibia. And if we look at our kinematically aligned knee, we can see that the average in our studies has been about 2.6 degrees. So it's right in that normal range with a relatively small standard deviation. 
And if we look at the mechanically aligned limb, it's just tilted in the opposite direction. You can actually see liftoff in the medial side, which gives medial adduction moment and increased li likelihood of medial wear and instability. And so mechanical alignment changes the obliquity and raises the level of the joint line and will unfortunately kinematically align the knee and lead to ligament imbalance. So we've been taught that the oblique joint line might be associated with increased wear. However, there's a long-term 10-year study that has shown this oblique joint line is associated with a 96% survivorship at 10 years. And this was from the Mayo Clinic. And it was total knee arthroplasty with a kinematic condylar prosthesis published in JBJS in 95. Their average joint line was 3 plus or minus 3 degrees. And it was associated with a 96% survivorship at 10 years. And so if you look at some of our results uh, compared to the 10-year follow-up study, here the 10-year follow-up study, the distribution of the percentage of subjects in 0, 5 degree valgus, 1 to 3 varus, 4 to 6 varus, and greater than 7 varus has sort of a broad range. And if you look at our kinematically aligned experience, the joint line averages a little less, about 2.6 degrees varus, with less standard deviation and less variability to the 10-year study. And very few are beyond the 4 to 6 degree varus. In fact, none are uh, very few in that range. So if the 10-year survivorship of the kinematic condylar prosthesis uh, in the Mayo Clinic experience can survive, then if you kinematically amal, uh, align the femoral component throughout the motion arc, then I think there's a reasonable chance that the survivorship will be at least as good and maybe even better. The second thing we've learned, besides not cutting perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur, is don't routinely externally rotate the femoral component. This is based on our JBJS article in 2010, where we assess the radii of the medial and lateral femoral condyles in the varus and valgus knee with end-stage osteoarthrosis. And we showed that the radius of the medial and lateral femoral condyle, whether it's a varus or valgus knee, is the same. We found no evidence, at least in this study, of hypoplasia in the valgus knee. There certainly can be an occasional congenital patient, but it's something that you probably won't see in more than 1-2,000 uh, patients. It's relatively rare. And so if you routinely externally rotate the femoral component 3 degrees, you will kin kinematically malalign the knee. And here's the properly placed femoral component on the uh, axial projection of the femoral bone model. And if we externally rotate 3 degrees, you can see that we've changed the orientation of the femoral component with respect to the axes. And now you're going to jam posterior laterally as you flex the knee. You're going to have decreased external rotation uh, as you flex the knee because of the tight compartment, hence leading to posterior lateral wear. And the third and final point is, I don't think you really want to reference the epicondylar axis. Dr. Eckhoff and Joel Bach from Colorado have shown that there's a substantial difference between the so-called epicondylar and cylindrical axis, or transverse axis of the knee, about which the tibia flexes and extends in their article in 2007. And what they showed is the epicondylar axis is not parallel to the posterior or distal joint line. And the difference between the apicondylar and transverse axis in three-dimensional space actually averages 5 degrees with a range from 2 to 11 degrees. So in conclusion, kinematically aligning a total knee arthroplasty is, well, relatively simple. You need to find the three kinematic axes. Shape match a symmetric single radius femoral component to the restored articular surface. Interoperatively, confirm that the four bone resections, the two distal and the two posterior resections, after adjusting for wear and kerf, equal the thickness of the femoral component. That's your interoperative checkpoint.
Be cautious cutting the femur perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur because it can lead to kinematic malalignment. Be cautious about externally rotating the femoral component because it too can lead to kinematic malalignment. And be cautious about aligning the femoral component to the epicondylar axis because the epicondylar axis is not equidistant from the distal and posterior joint lines and will lead to an oblique placement of the component and non-kinematic behavior. These steps all together will change the obliquity and level of the joint line both distally and posteriorly which often kinematically malaligns the knee.